The following interrogation footage has never been seen before. Oh. Grandma. Oh my God. I'm not going to ask any questions right now until we get... <laughs> what would make a grandmother emotionally break down like that? For Karen Brooke, it was the murder her 15-year-old granddaughter, Alyssa Bustamante, just confessed to. If you had to describe Alyssa Bustamante's childhood with a single word, it would undoubtedly be tragic. According to case documents, Alyssa confided in a mental health professional that she had been subjected to severe mistreatment at a young age. The resulting trauma led to Alyssa being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and the doctor stated she developed an abhorrence for violence. She'd been the result of a teenage pregnancy, as her mother Michelle was only 15 years old when she was born. Though her grandparents were excited to have grandchildren, Alyssa's parents, Michelle and Caesar, weren't prepared for parenthood. It wasn't long before Alyssa was joined by three younger siblings, twin brothers, and a sister named Emma. The children grew up in a turbulent household. Cesar Bustamante was eventually charged with three counts of assault and was sentenced to serve three concurrent prison terms. There was no stability for Alyssa, her brothers, and sister, and they were often evicted, forcing them to constantly pack up and move. Michelle's parents, Karen and Gary Brooke, stepped in to help take care of the children. However, they soon found that many of their efforts, such as sending food to the family and visiting, were all in vain. Eventually, they realized that there was only one thing they could do that would truly make a difference in the children's lives. The grandparents decided to campaign for full custody of Alyssa and her siblings. When they gained full custody of the children, Alyssa was about eight years old, Living with her grandparents offered her stability for the first time in her life, but Alyssa had already been exposed to far too much. Seeking a new start, Alyssa's grandparents moved the family to the small town of St. Martins, Missouri, where they bought a nice home on a large piece of land. Right away, the twin boys and Emma flourished in their new location, but Alyssa seemed to have difficulty adjusting. It was in this small town of just over a thousand people where everyone knows everyone, that Alyssa's gruesome crime would devastate all who live there. It was Wednesday, October 21st, 2009, when Alyssa's younger sister, Emma Bustamante, now six years old, knocked on the Olten's front door. She wanted nine-year-old Elizabeth Olten to come out and play. The Bustamantes and Olten's only lived four houses down from each other, and the two young girls would often play at each other's houses. But on this particular day, Elizabeth would never make it home. Elizabeth Olton was a typical girly girl. Before Emma showed up at Elizabeth's house, she'd been excitedly practicing her lines at the dining room table for an upcoming musical, Noteworthy. Elizabeth's mother, Patty, said she couldn't go play at first. Dinner would be ready soon, but the girls begged her enough for her to finally give in. Patty gave her daughter clear instructions to be home by 6 p.m., when the sun would nearly be set in late October, and Patty trusted that Elizabeth would come home since the fourth grader was terrified of the dark. Emma and Elizabeth played board games and hopscotch in the Bustamante driveway. Eventually, Elizabeth told Emma that she needed to go home. Emma stood on the big rock by her driveway and watched her friend begin her walk home. However, she didn't stay to see if Elizabeth made it all the way home safely. Emma was later asked by investigators if Elizabeth might have walked through the woods to get home, but she was adamant that they never went in the woods. Emma continued playing outside, though she didn't know for how long. At some point, she lost a hair tie in the thorns by her driveway, and when she tried to retrieve it, she scratched her hand and her foot got stuck. Emma said she yelled until Alyssa came to help her, claiming Alyssa had been in the house and heard her through an open window. As Alyssa helped her out of the thorns, Emma noticed a spot of blood on the thigh of Alyssa's pants. She asked her sister about it, who explained it away by saying she had her period. Alyssa made her little sister promise not to tell anyone about the blood. When 6 p.m. passed, Elizabeth hadn't returned home. Worried, Patty called Elizabeth's cell phone over and over, but there was no answer. Patty then called Emma's grandmother, Karen, 
to ask if Elizabeth was still at their house. Karen told her that Elizabeth had never even been to the home and wasn't even aware that the girls had been playing. She hung up and immediately called the police. Authorities began their investigation by interviewing the last known person Elizabeth was with, Emma Bustamante. Emma described playing with Elizabeth from approximately 5 to 6 p.m. before Elizabeth left for home. Grandma Karen sat in the room during this questioning, Emma continually glancing at her as she answered the investigator's questions. There was one detail Emma gave that struck investigators as odd. The blood stain she spotted on Alyssa's pants. Karen seemed removed from the interview, but toward the end she stated, We just want the truth to come out, whatever it is. By 10 p.m., word of the missing nine-year-old spread through this small town, and hundreds of residents came out in support of the Olton family to search for little Elizabeth. When they had searched the whole neighborhood, as well as the woods, and turned up nothing, law enforcement decided to ping Elizabeth's cell phone and found that it led back to the 60 acres of woods behind her home. Volunteers then made a strange discovery, a hole in the woods in the shape of a grave. As the forensics team began to process the scene, the FBI began interviewing Alyssa. For reasons that are still unknown, they brought her to the hole where Alyssa admitted something odd. She dug the hole. When questioned why exactly she dug it, she said she just likes digging holes and would bury dead animals when she found them. Strangely, the hole ended up being empty, but investigators knew something was very off with Alyssa. They then conducted a search of her room and discovered a shocking key piece of evidence, one that they would wait to confront Alyssa with until her videotaped interrogation. This led to the most dramatic meltdown in any interrogation we've analyzed yet. Oh, dear, I don't get to you. Huh? Yeah, it rocks. So if, if you don't mind, if I sit here so I can write, because yeah. I'm going to be taking a lot of notes, so... Okay. It's important to note that when a person is brought in for interrogation, law enforcement have likely developed a reasonable suspicion that the person is involved in the crime. Karen accompanied Alyssa in the interrogation room. Going in, she fully believed Alyssa was innocent. She was in for the shock of her life as the truth began to unfold right before her eyes. Walk me through exactly what happened. We didn't go to seminary that day, right? Okay, so I woke up. I don't know if I told you this story before. I'm not sure if I told you this story before. Okay, so I woke up. I don't know if I told you this story before. Okay, so I woke up. I don't know if I told you this story before. So I went to school, okay. and I was there all day, and then I came home on the bus, and I got home around 3, no, 4, 3.30, 3.30, 4. I get home around then, and I just hung out in my room for a little while, and then I went for a walk around 5, 4.30, 5, something like that. She is feigning ignorance, commonly referred to as playing dumb. I was just walking around in the forest for a while. And I was supposed to take my little sister with me, but I ditched her because she's annoying. Okay. And I was just walking around in the forest. And then for about an hour, I came back around 5.36-ish. And I went up in my room and I heard like yelling. So I went outside and I like, she was down in the like ditch area. She was stuck in thorn bushes. So I went down there and I helped her out. And she asked me why I was waiting. Cause you know, I found out on my period. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, don't tell me about that. And so we went out there and my brother and Andy they were asking about her because she, they supposed, she was supposed to be at home or something. Okay. And I didn't really think much of it, so we just went back to the house. Alyssa nonchalantly shrugs her right shoulder. Shrugging only one shoulder is considered a modified shrug or a variant of a natural shoulder shrug. Abnormal movements like this often suggest uncertainty in what the person is conveying. She leans to her left, an additional nonverbal display of discomfort. The interrogator is in the position of power blocking the only exit. Although she initially appeared comfortable, Bustamante is now attempting to regain her power in a position of powerlessness. 
and then started to get ready to go to church because we have Wednesday night activities. Okay. And he came, and he's like, he was pat on the door, and he was like, "Do you know where my birthday is?" Because he couldn't find her. She begins to nod her head as she speaks. This does not align with her baseline pattern of nonverbal behavior. Something is off. Although we can only speculate, this may serve as a self-pacifying behavior. Bustamante is assuring herself that what she says is believable. Alternatively, Bustamante's head movements could be a conscious or subconscious manipulative nonverbal meant to spur agreement and empathy in the interrogator. And that's when things started to get, you know, people were like, oh, what's going on? Like, where is she? Continue to observe all the nonverbal indicators of discomfort that we mentioned previously. But take note of contrasts. But we ended up going to church. And um, a lot of stuff happened while we were there. Because it's from 7 to 8.15-ish. And when we came back, there was three shared cars in our property. And there was people out searching everywhere. Uh-huh. And um, that's pretty much it. I went to sleep after that. Okay. Bustamante says, um, here. She does not use this consistently throughout the interrogation. It is not one of her baseline tendencies. Because she does not regularly say, um, this moment is worth noting. It's also interesting to note that Alyssa uses what is known as an exclusion qualifier when she states, that's pretty much it. According to the retired CIA interrogator, Philip Houston, an exclusion qualifier is defined as being a tactic that enables people who want to withhold certain information to answer your question truthfully without releasing that information. Examples of exclusion qualifiers include statements such as not really, fundamentally, for the most part, probably, and so on. That's pretty much it. I want to sleep after that. By stating that's pretty much it, she's technically being truthful, but only by leaving out key details and withholding information, specifically the murder of Elizabeth Olton. When the CIA is interrogating an individual, they conduct both body language and statement analysis. They look for clusters of three or more indicators that occur in either quick succession or all at once. This exact moment is the perfect example of what a CIA officer looks for during an interrogation to determine if someone is being deceitful. Um, that's pretty much it. I want to sleep that. When Alyssa states that's pretty much it, there are four indicators that occur within just a few seconds. The aforementioned um, um, a half shrug of the shoulder, shaking of the head, and then nodding the head. Note how she shakes her head no as she states, that's pretty much it. Um, that's pretty much it. This is known as incongruent body language. Though of course, you always want to look for clusters. This particular moment is significant as it's paired with other indicators, including statement analysis. Alyssa employs the exclusion qualifier multiple times throughout the interrogation. See if you can spot the other moments where she employs this tactic and post the timestamps in the comments. Okay. Alyssa gives Officer David Rice the outline of her movements on Wednesday the 21st, but two things become clear during this retelling of events. Alyssa had come into contact with Elizabeth Olton on the day she went missing. And Alyssa unwittingly places herself in the woods where Elizabeth's cell phone last pinged and where eventually they'll find Elizabeth. This confirms opportunity and the place for the crime to take place. But Alyssa's demeanor comes across as calm and confident. Now, you have a boyfriend. I do. Okay, what's his name? His name's Dust. Okay. Do you know, has anybody talked to him about... Any of this, sir? I'm pretty sure he's been interviewed. Okay. Alyssa's boyfriend had been interviewed by law enforcement, and when the interview opens, we see him biting his nails and looking nervous. According to the case files, there had been an eyewitness who claimed to see a teen allegedly resembling him near the location of Elizabeth's disappearance. This interview took place after Alyssa's own interrogation, though he was also interviewed previously as well. And as the interview begins... He had just taken a polygraph test and was about to be confronted with the results. You're not, you're not being truthful with me about everything that's going on here. You know, and we need to get, we need to come to the, we need to get come to the, we need to get the truth. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. You know, 
we know a lot more stuff than we're leading on to, to believe. We've talked to several people. The interrogator sits closely to Bustamante's boyfriend, Dustin, and speaks with authority. He states that they know Dustin has more information. This is a direct confrontation approach to interrogation. We've talked to several of your friends. We've talked to several of his friends. And they've told us some stuff. They've told us some phone conversations they've had and everything. So what do you know? I don't know anything. What do you know? Nothing. All that I know is what the FBI told me. Why is the polygraph telling me different? Why is your body telling me different? Why is your heart telling me different? So nervous. Nervous has nothing to do with it. We've talked about that. The interrogator is looking for a reason why Dustin is nervous. The polygraph test is all about psychophysiological detection of deception, PDD, or the use of physiological measures to detect lying. It measures certain autonomic physiological markers, such as heart rate, perspiration, and blood pressure. Examiners measure these markers at suspects' baselines before they're interrogated. Then they measure how these markers change from question to question. These markers are associated with anxiety, which is often present when one lies. The interrogator knows that Dustin is nervous. However, the polygraph cannot show exactly why he is nervous, when he is nervous. An adrenaline spike to a question could indicate lying or some other form of emotional arousal, not directly related to the topic of the question. The interviewer isn't outright saying if he failed the lie detector test. Later case documents revealed the polygraph's results. Alyssa's boyfriend was asked three questions during this polygraph, all concerning Elizabeth. Did you physically cause her death? Did you physically take her life? Did you do anything physical that ended her life? He answered no to all three. Yet according to the case files, it was determined that he was being deceptive in some way with his answers to all three questions. Nervousness has nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. Your heart rebels against a lie when you can only tell a lie. And there's nothing you can do to control it. You can try to control your breathing all you want. You can think of other things all you want. But your heart, that right there, is going to tell the truth. The heart is the first autonomic physiological baseline measurement collected. Some studies suggest that both heart rate and respiration rate show no significant increase or decrease depending on whether the subject told the truth. But research has produced mixed results. Regardless of these inconsistencies, what is most telling is how suspects respond when under the impression that they were caught in a lie. Let us see how Dustin reacts when the interrogator implements this technique a technique we will explain in just a moment. What if I told you that we, inter- we did a, a neighborhood canvas out there and talked to all the neighbors who live out there, even the neighbors who live in, in the subdivision behind behind where I live, and then lives in the subdivision behind where I live. We talked to all those neighbors. We did a car, we did a spot check out there with cars, and all the cars that came off and came through there, we stopped and talked to them. What if I told you somebody saw a kid about your size in a black hoodie with a black t-shirt and blue jeans on standing there on the side of the road next to the guardrail? From that point on, we see the interview begin to use what is called the read technique. The read technique is an interrogation type used in the accusatory process. An interviewer tells the suspect that the results of the investigation clearly indicate they committed the crime in question. It's a three-phase process, beginning with fact analysis, then a behavioral analysis interview. This phase is designed to be non-accusatory to develop investigative and behavioral information. The third phase follows, when appropriate, the nine steps of interrogation. And we did a photo lineup. What you can do a photo lineup. We did. During the initial neighborhood police canvas, the eyewitness said that they had seen a strange boy in a dark t-shirt and baggy pants standing alone at a guardrail near where Elizabeth went missing. The eyewitness had been shown a copy of Alyssa's boyfriend's driver's license photo, and they claimed that the picture resembled the person they had seen. We know that eyewitness testimony is notoriously inaccurate. 
Though admissible in court, witnesses rely on autobiographical memory, specifically episodic memory, which is a type of recall involving events with contextual details, such as where and when something occurred. This type of memory is sensitive to memory bias. A witness might recall a suspect wearing a blue shirt a day after the occurrence, but state that the shirt was red a week later. So why is it? I wasn't there. Alyssa's boyfriend comes across pretty confident, borderline defiant, when he looks the interviewer directly in the eyes. It's interesting to see him be combative with the interviewer at the mention of law enforcement having already done a photo lineup. Contrary to popular belief, anger is a more common reaction in individuals accused of something that is not true. If law enforcement had completed a photo lineup and it led to a positive identification, he would have already been arrested and charged. The constant accusation becomes exhausting, and suspects just want the process to end. They assume that admitting something will end the interrogation, and most suspects think that invoking the rights of silence and counsel will label them as guilty. Alyssa's boyfriend is strong-willed throughout the entire interrogation and didn't take any of the bait the interviewer dangled in front of him. After he is questioned by the interrogator in the video, he's then questioned by Sergeant Rice. It was then that he confirmed the investigator's suspicions all along. He had been hiding something. Exactly. What did she tell you? that she killed her. She told you that she strangled her. And what else? Cut her lips. She didn't get into detail with that. She just said strangled her and cut her. On October 22nd, Alyssa had gone to his house and told him about the crime she'd committed just the day before. He denied having ever been involved in the crime and said he wasn't present when it happened. So why had he lied? I gave away information that got her locked up. When, it, when she, like, I have a family, and she comes, she finds out where I live because she's obsessed about it and kills everybody. What if she gets out on bail and she finds out a way how to get take off her ankle bracelet and she comes and kills me in my sleep and my mom? and then finds out where my sister lives and kills her. Scared of what? Her and if I'm gonna have any more girlfriends like this. <laughs> you poor guy. Well, I guess they're not all crazy. I guess that's understandable. Dustin was never implicated in the murder of Elizabeth Olden. Back in Alyssa's interrogation, Sergeant David Rice pulls a map of the surrounding woods and neighborhood. There's like a tree line. Do you want to like draw this for you? I have a map. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't now, the thing, thing about this, this map, okay. I don't think it has Our where your actually house is. So the way I understand it's the new right house here. would be right back here. Is that yes. right? Okay, let's say the new house is ballpark here. And then there's a trail that goes out here, and it's like right. Draw for me if you want. Okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure how far back it goes. It's like past all the clearings, and then when it starts to get to like a smaller trail and whatnot, there's a little side thing. It's like a side trail I go off on. It's something we always do is we'll walk, walk a person through their day, and we make a timeline just so we uh, um, go through everything. So, what time did you go for your walk? The interrogator is using the TED technique, or the tell, explain, describe technique. He is making it clear to Bustamante that he wants her to recount the day of events as a narrative. By recounting the day of events as a narrative, Bustamante is more likely to reveal other telling personal or contextual details. I went for a walk around 4.30 or 5. I was walking around the neighborhood and I messed around before you went on your walk, do you think? 
I was home at least an hour. hour okay, so so about four thirty or five, you went. Right. Well, there's there's a I believe that this little line here is the trail or something. But Did like, you go out all this way over yes. here? And there's, then where'd you go from here? I just kept following the. Uh, where path. does it go from here? Show me. The interrogator speaks more rapidly and presses Bustamante for an answer. During this portion of the interrogation, Bustamante has displayed many disruptions in speech, frequently saying um and like, um, like, like, but like uh, and altering her vocal intonation. Um, it goes like, it does some turns and whatnot, but it's a pretty easy path to follow. It's like okay. a road path. Well, I mean, show me what, does it loop back around then? No, no, it doesn't loop. It like goes this way, I think. Okay, and then what'd you do? And then the, the pastor, I just hung out at the creek. And then, then what'd you do? I came back. Then you walked back? Yes. And then what'd you do? I went home. She draws out the I and ends by saying home with an upward inflection. I went home. This is what linguists would say. One, upward inflections are used when asking questions. Bustamante lacks confidence. Two, drawing out words conveys a double meaning but the statement is not implicative or not meant to convey a double meaning. Put together, her underlying communication is, I am not confident in what I am saying and what I am saying is in conflict with what I am thinking. As we move forward, listen for these subtle cues. Sometimes it is not just one word, but a combination of words that tell the true story. How long did that take you to do? Um, it takes about... How long were you on your walk? It's about last Walk? It's about 15 or 20 minutes, I believe. Right? Remember, it's the first half after we went to? When we took Princess with us? It's been a long time. Yeah, okay. Okay. Really How long were you gone that day after walk? I was gone for about an hour. Okay, so you were gone about an hour. Mm -hmm. When you walked out there, the cow pasture, what were you doing up there? Um, I was just, you know, enjoying nature, taking a walk. Alyssa happily draws the path she took on her walk for Sergeant Rice, which confirms her knowledge of the surrounding woods. She recounts her day again. Suspects are typically asked to repeat their story several times so that law enforcement can look for inconsistencies or for information that only the perpetrator of a crime would know. We went to church and just did the activities till 8, came back, and everything was crazy. So you got back at 8, and then... I mean, what, what did they tell you? What? Well, they were like, yeah, there's three sheriffs here. People were out searching for her. They can't find her. They did just say they, they missing? Like, yeah, they were like questioning me about the day. They didn't actually question me that day, though, because I went up to do a take a shower. And then, I don't know, they just left or something. And I went to bed. So they just told you it was missing? Well, my grandpa did, yes. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Uh, I was just, I, I didn't think it would, like, you know, happen. The interrogator asks how it made Bustamante feel, and she responds cognitively, explaining what she thought instead of how she felt. It is easier to describe thoughts than emotions for individuals who struggle to identify emotions. It could be reasonably assumed that Bustamante is emotionally stunted in certain but not all ways. Like, things like this don't happen. Even though she says that she didn't think something like this, a little girl going missing could happen in St. Martin's, Missouri, she doesn't seem too concerned or shocked or surprised. The investigator then asks what Alyssa knows about Elizabeth. Tell me about Um, well, she's, I don't know, she's nine? Okay. I don't really know that much about her either. Um, I mean, tell me what you do know about her. Okay. She'd come over and swim. She's kind of girly, like okay. not, not like naturistic, I guess you okay. could say. She can be annoying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, there's been, uh, you know, there were some folks out there uh, out in the forest, I guess, digging some holes or looking at some holes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I guess you know, they had said that you like to go out there and, and dig holes. So I mean, uh, I'm going to have to ask you some stuff about yourself. Okay. Um, 
because you know obviously that plays in there if they were looking holes and you're out there in the forest and that sort of thing so could, right. i guess just tell tell me a little bit about yourself so i understand where all this is uh, coming from um i really like nature animals being outside it's okay it's just you know naturistic like that and i get bored really easily okay. and i'm entertained really easily okay. so you know digging holes just something to do Alyssa keeps this explanation casual and surface level. It sounds like digging holes is genuinely a hobby for her, which doesn't seem too odd given the fact she's a teenage girl in a small town with probably not a lot to do. But at the same time, it's still interesting to note. She mentions that her brothers and her dig holes all the time, sometimes near their home, sometimes out in the woods. Okay. You just like to dig holes? And I like to climb trees. Okay. Oh, and I bury um, dead animals that I find because I believe it's respectful to them. Okay. Okay. It almost seems like Alyssa is beginning to understand where the direction of questioning is starting to head. Yet her behavior remains calm. David Rice, as the main interviewer, is playing everything very casual. He makes it seem like he's on her side and doesn't believe she has anything to do with Elizabeth Olton going missing. Um, what kind of holes do you dig? Um, Tell me about these holes you dig. Well, you dig them a certain way every time, or just, just dig a hole. Just dig a hole, very much. Okay. Just wherever they're at. I mean, do you dig a certain spot or what? Well, whether digging holes is a hobby of Alyssa's or not, she makes it seem like the most normal thing in the world for a fifteen-year-old to do in the woods. <laughs> I'm such a not dirt kind of girl. Yeah. That's amazing to me. I, I don't do worms and I don't do dirt. Well, so I'm in rugby. Oh. And so, like, we do a lot of contact physical oh. in the mud and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I. Yeah, it's I several really enjoy rugby. That's kind of the thing right now, isn't it? Yeah. The interrogation turns into a friendly conversation between the juvenile counselor, Ms. Toby Mayer. The woman sat next to Alyssa and told the rest of the room about how girls rugby is a new sport to the area. High school girl rugby, and they get after it. Oh, I'm sure they yes, do. Yes, they do. The school doesn't sure sponsor it because it's too dangerous, but there's a team okay. in Jeff City. I know there's at least two teams form. in Jeff City. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure about the other one, but I love one of them. And you good. love it? I do. And you love the mud? It's and so you love dirt fun. under your fingernails? Do you mind worms? Sergeant Rice gets right back to business, steering the conversation back to the holes. This hole that you dug, when did you dig that hole? I Sunday. Sunday? I yes. Why did you dig that hole? Because Sunday I was bored. You don't really do much on Sunday. Can't watch TV, play video games, you know. So, sad to go outside. There's something in her voice that tells you she's not being entirely truthful. She's also beginning to nod her head a lot which could be her way of trying to convince Sergeant Rice that her story is true. When did you dig it? Ooh. I think my grandpa would have the exact time. This statement is odd. It's unclear how or why Alyssa's grandpa would know the exact time the hole was dug, especially considering what is revealed later. It, I don't really remember. What were you doing Sunday? I mean, tell me about Sunday then. Her nonverbal indicators are more obvious. Look for the self-pacifying behaviors mentioned earlier, in addition to new behaviors like lip licking and interlocking fingers. We didn't go to church Sunday, right? Because we were at mom's house, I believe. I was at my mom's house for the weekend. Okay. She lives at the lake. And we came back around five, and I know I dug it before dark, so it was sometime in between. Wait, what time did we come home? I didn't think yet till six. Well, it must have been in between like six thirty, seven, I guess. You picked her up where? Um, Eugene. You picked <coughs> her up at six p.m. at Eugene. Right. And it's uh, how long the drive? Half hour. So you got back home six thirty, six forty-five ish, probably. Maybe been right at six thirty. Six thirty. About twenty five minutes. Well, it's getting dark by then. Yeah. Well, so, right. so you got home at six thirty. Yes. And how did you dig a hole? At, what? So what did you well, do on Sunday? Well, I'm not asking what your grandpa what You got home at 6.30 on Sunday. What did you do then? Oh, 
I think I took a shower and went to sleep, so I don't think I did it. I think it was Saturday, actually. No, because I wasn't here Saturday. Bustamante is digging herself deeper and deeper into her own hole. You weren't here Saturday. Nope. On Sunday. Right. Monday. I think it was Friday then, because I was here Friday. It wouldn't seem possible. Right. Right. And you weren't here Saturday. Right. And you didn't do it during the week, because there's only Monday, Tuesday. Right. So then you're thinking it had to be Friday. Yes. These weaknesses in her story will later be exploited in the interrogation. But for now, David is playing it close to his chest. He's aware her story is changing, and it seems like Alyssa is also realizing that her story is starting to fall apart. Okay, so tell me about Friday. Do you remember Friday? Did you go to school on Friday? We didn't, have, we didn't okay. have school Friday. No school on Friday. So I got up around like noon. Okay. So were uh, Grandma and Grandpa home on Friday? Or did you I work on Friday? Saturday. You were at half day, so we, you've been home at noon? Um, to to okay, so was she asleep when you got home? I, I just did not recall. Okay. So then Friday, what you do? Think back to Friday. After getting up, I hung out for a while at the house, and it was a nice day Friday. She is deflecting or attempting to redirect focus elsewhere. In certain contexts, hair stroking is a pacifying behavior. Hair stroking is not one of Bustamante's baseline behaviors and is occurring in a high-pressure context. This is likely a pacifying behavior. Bustamante is uncomfortable. Relatively nice day, so I decided to go outside and just do whatever. And I dug a hole. Alyssa's bouncing around more than she was at the beginning of the interrogation. She's rocking back and forth, nodding her head. It seems that as her story is unraveling, so are her nerves of steel. Why did you dig that hole? Um, because I was bored. And I felt like doing something. Cause Tell me about that hole, though. It's a very specific hole. I mean, very... It's a very unique hole, I should say. Are all of your holes like that? No. Okay. But why... You dug the hole, so you know yes. you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Rice is describing the hole in a vague way to see if Alyssa might add anything that would explain why she dug it. She doesn't really have an answer or a reason to give as to why she dug that particular hole. That was a very, very unique hole. Mm -hmm. I guess. I was digging. I mean, whatever shape comes to mind, I was just... Entertaining myself? I, the reason I'm asking, I just, it just seems like a, and you can understand why as uh, if people were out in the woods looking for, yeah. if looking for a person yes. if they were lost or God forbid looking for, if they thought it was a, you know, God forbid a body, why they would be alarmed by that hole because they're, you know, come along a, a hole a uh, freshly dug hole that was, I so think, a perfect rectangle about three feet by about four and a half, five foot, straight shovel marks down, mm -hmm. about, as you described when I talked to you out there, about that deep. Mm -hmm. um, Interrogators probe for specific answers after asking broad, open-ended questions. This is, again, part of the TED interrogative technique or the tell, explain, describe technique. Imagine the flow of interrogation as a funnel. Alyssa's interrogation has become more focused, narrower. Rice is asking a very specific probing question. Not only does he ask a very specific probing question, but he illustrates with his hands the exact size and shape of the hole. Straight down the first few inches of dirt, uh, you know, up until you get to that real hard packed dirt, almost as if somebody were digging down, got to a point where you got to those roots in that hard dirt and realized it's too hard to dig. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Rice relays details and speculation surrounding the crime scene, but does so from Alyssa's perspective. Alyssa is likely to identify with the story he tells. Liars tend to distance themselves from their lies. But Rice has psychologically repositioned her into a self-identifying mindset. Her nonverbal indicators become increasingly prominent. 
most people, if they were just going to bury a bunny or, or something out there, you know, they dig. Well, I'm digging a hole, by God, just dig a hole. But for a 15 year old girl to dig a perfectly rectangle, three by four or five square rectangle hole, it just caught a lot of people as very odd. That makes sense, it does. The hole Alyssa dug is the perfect size and shape for a small grave. It's a perfect three foot by five foot rectangle, shallow, and is alarming to come across during a search for a missing child. What do you think about that? When Sergeant Rice asks, what do you think about that to Alyssa, he's using the theory of the crime development, where the investigator knows there was a crime, but doesn't understand all the steps involved and doesn't fully comprehend the motive. This is where interrogators will use deceptively innocent questions to get the suspect to fill in the gaps and create a plausible working understanding of the events. Well, I guess, you know, the timing for digging that hole was definitely not good. Have you ever dug a hole like that before? I have. There's an entire discussion about other holes of similar shape and size that she's dug before. These holes are where she buries animals but there's no clear indication if Alyssa happened upon these animals' bodies or killed them herself. It doesn't matter if it's a year old. They can, oh. they have sonar, they can run right over it, and they can tell you the shape, the depth, the whole thing. I mean, these, we're talking about guys that have uh, the FBI, they have instruments that can do <laughs> just, just about everything. This is subtle intimidation meant to imply that Alyssa need not lie. Have you dug a hole like this before then, or is this the first time? It's not completely like this, but it's like, kind of like that. Okay. Like, so this big enough for a shoebox. Okay, but this is the first time of that size? Yes, yes. Okay. But okay. well, what about the big round ones that I keep, kept falling in, and I mean, they're deep. <laughs> and I kept telling him, did you guys quit doing this? Because they're dangerous, and we used yeah. to ride our horses up there, and I could like, sure. I mean, they're huge. Okay. There's like three or four of them. Yeah. This digging, is, now this is on our property. Digging pits for a while. <laughs> I don't know. It was entertaining. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we like to make traps just occasionally, you know, put some sticks over it and some leaves. Yeah, we find For you to break oh, away. Yeah. <laughs> well, if they have horses, that's not a good idea, Liz. Well, we don't ride our horses out there. I was going to say, you know, if a horse breaks right, its leg, right. what happens? I know, but we, yeah. we, we didn't do that. We can grab a horse or something. Well, we used to. We, have we used to, but we don't. You have so. horses. You have horses. I do. They're not rectangle. They're big round ones. Big round I don't know what that matters. Okay. okay. Um, did, uh, did ever go on walks with you in the woods? Nope. The questions asked here are entrapment questions, and if any inconsistencies are found, the suspect's statements would be treated as lies. This type of questioning places additional pressure on the suspect as the interrogation continues. I've I know you said her. she was a girly girl. Yeah, I've but... never seen her in the woods. Okay. I mean, did, did you ever take her on walks in the woods or anything like that? When I go on walks, I like to go with myself. Okay. Here we see a clear inconsistency in what Alyssa is saying and what her body is saying. When asked if she has ever gone on walks with Elizabeth in the woods, Alyssa states, nope. Her head movement transitions from side to side to up and down. Alyssa's body tells a different story. What do you know about all of this so far? Obviously, unfortunately, your poor family's been thrown in the middle of this. His additional comments, such as, your poor family has been thrown into the middle of this, relay that he feels sympathy for Alyssa and her family, however false that sympathy might be. What do you know about this whole investigation or mess? She's still missing. They're out looking for her. They don't want more volunteers because there's a lot of volunteers so far. It's, this is really big. They've had helicopters yeah, they searching have. as well. And... Oh, that's pretty much what I know. As noted previously, she responds cognitively rather than from a place of feeling. She doesn't have much to say about her family when Toby and Sergeant Rice start empathizing with what Elizabeth's family must be feeling. And interestingly, her face falls into a neutral expression and she stays silent. It's very sad for her. Yeah, I imagine if she was missing, God, it would be awful. Yeah, and her mom and her family has... Yeah. I mean, that's why they're making such a big deal about this. Yeah. I mean, can you, like, it, like she said, it, it, I mean, you, you can understand why all this is going on. The stairs went so 
I was screaming outside. I mean, I just can't. I know. I've got kids, so I can't, mm -hmm. can't even imagine. What do you think happened to Elizabeth? Sergeant Rice moves into opinion questions now. Many interrogation questions are closed, meaning they warrant a yes or no response or elicit a single fact or piece of information. Opinion questions are open-ended. Interrogation studies have shown that open-ended questions will get all suspects to talk longer and to be more likely to divulge incriminating evidence without even realizing it. Huh? I really don't think she would run away because she's nine. And the way that they've been searching for two days, never got any sign of her. So I, I think that maybe someone kidnapped her or something. It's a terrible thing. But I, I don't know what else to assume. Okay. Innocent individuals might be more likely to mention that they don't know. Guilty individuals might feel more compelled to provide an explanation that doesn't fit with the crime they committed. We see this as Alyssa evades the topic of murder. Would she have easily been lured into a car? I mean, was she that kind of girl? I don't, I, I don't know anything about her. Would she, I mean, would oh. she have been like a, with a kitten? I mean, maybe. Um, you'd have to ask her mom about sure. that. Sure, sure. Do you, I mean, do you think somebody did something to her? I mean, is that? That seems most likely, because I don't think she'd be the kind of person that would like hide or stay out all night or anything like that. Okay. Is there anybody in that area you can think of that would, I mean, that comes to mind that you would think of that would, that would do that? Is there anybody that knowing your neighbors that you would? No. Rice baits Alyssa to place blame. Guilty suspects commonly deflect and offer helpful explanations as Alyssa does here. But there is a lot of cars to drive down that highway. Okay, a couple, just a few opinion questions. I'm just asking your opinion because... What follows are loaded questions. Here is the first one broken down. What type of person do you think would do this sort of thing to a nine-year-old girl? One, it's assumptive. It assumes that someone did something to Elizabeth. Two, it's vague. It assumes that someone did something but doesn't specify what that something is. Three, use of this versus that. This is used as a definite article. In grammar, the function of a definite article is to imply but not state what is being referred to. In other words, this is used in such a way that the speaker is assuming that the listener knows what this is. Further, this implies that something is closer to the listener, whereas that implies that something is further away. Four, Use of nine-year-old girl. This is distancing language, or language that creates psychological distance from the main topic of discussion, i.e. use of that versus my. Up until this point, they've referred to Elizabeth by name. It also calls attention to Elizabeth's vulnerability. Five, it's a mirror. Guilty parties are forced to analyze themselves and resultingly come face to face with who they are and why they did what they did. This can produce observable signs of cognitive dissonance, a subjective experience of discomfort when two or more ways of thinking, feeling, or otherwise experiencing clash. The dissonance may include discordant ideas, beliefs, behavior, etc. What type of person do you think would do this sort of thing to a nine-year-old girl? Um... Uh sick person, like someone that, I don't know, can put down all their morals and just take a nine-year-old girl. Alyssa pauses, stutters, and struggles to get the words out. She's looking in the mirror. She parrots Rice, nine-year-old girl, using a parallel tone and inflection. Sociopaths and psychopaths hide in plain sight, by observing and mimicking the mannerisms and behaviors of those around them. The word this served as a placeholder. Whatever Alyssa said would represent what she knew this to be. But Alyssa evaded this trap. She could have filled that placeholder with kill, but she filled it with take. On the other hand, this could be seen as a slip-up 
as Alyssa did technically take Elizabeth into the woods. Whenever we find out what happened to her, if somebody did something to her, what do you think should happen to them? I think they should get uh, convicted. Well, yeah, because all the trouble that they caused him so far. Okay. Alyssa is faced with her fate. We can see and hear her cognitive dissonance in her ums, pauses, and nonverbals, which all indicate discomfort. There are many areas in which Alyssa could slip up and incriminate herself. For instance, she could use possessive language, say I instead of they. She may be aware of this, suggestive from her halting breaks in speech. The next questions that follow are direct and straight to the point, even though he prefaces that he asks everybody these questions. I'm going to ask you because I ask everybody. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything to her? No. Did you cause her disappearance? No. Did you kill her? No. Do you know where she's at right now? No. Okay. Alyssa's responses may seem convincing. She says no with conviction, appearing to shake her head back and forth in tandem. We covered that inconsistencies between verbal and nonverbal behaviors imply lying. So why do Alyssa's verbal and nonverbal behaviors appear consistent with one another? A closer look reveals that Alyssa ever so slightly nods her head up and down after each no response. Incongruent head movements are more often subtle, as we see with Alyssa, than exaggerated. Directly following the big question, did you kill Elizabeth? Alyssa says no and begins to shake her head back and forth, but stops halfway. She's not committed to what she's saying. I, I may have, I may have, I, I'm new to this. Mm-hmm. But, um, so, was playing with That's my understanding. And when was that? Oh, they were, sometime after I had gone in the forest, because I guess, I just decided to go over it with this. Oh, uh, after you ran away, yes. she went to find somebody new to play with. Mm-hmm. Can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, go ahead. Do I need to stop? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I didn't know the door was Do you need some water? Oh, water. Oh. Okay. You do. Okay. After a break in the interrogation, Alyssa sits quietly in the room alone, rocking back and forth as with other repetitive body movements is a self-pacifying, non-verbal behavior. Toby takes advantage of downtime to build rapport with Alyssa. Because I'm your roommate, too. Uh, it's not through the school, because it's too dangerous. Life. Right. As soon as Detective Rice re-enters the room, Alyssa begins to immediately display the self-pacifying behavior of hair stroking, something she didn't do right until the moment Rice reappeared. I'm good. Okay. Everybody good? Everybody good on drinks and everything? So, okay. Alyssa sits expressionless as Rice and Toby exchange lighthearted small talk. You know, I used to talk to my parents, you know, and they said, you know, I grew up listening. You know, we didn't have a TV, we had a radio. And I'm like, God, that's. You didn't have a television? You didn't have the internet? <laughs> Sergeant Rice asks about Elizabeth Olton's cell phone and tells Alyssa that law enforcement knows Elizabeth had her phone at the time of her disappearance. She's told that with the software available to law enforcement, they can find any cell phone anywhere on the planet. It's a simple scare tactic, but it's a way to say that any lies will be found out. Is there any reason at all that your fingerprints would be on that cell phone? No. Okay. So if that cell phone were processed, your fingerprints would not be on it. Right. Can you think of any reason why, if if you ever touched that cell phone, have you ever held that cell phone? I mean, in the past, any time at all? Now, it's my understanding that, uh, did the FBI do a search or something of of the house where you guys lived? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What what was that all about? Um, They searched our house, I guess, for any signs of and they found stuff in my room, but not like evidence like that. They had like marijuana seeds. And, <laughs> and you understand, 
I don't care about marijuana seeds or any of that. And they found um, my medication. Yeah. Don't care about that. Yeah. This is not what we're here about. Has it ever been in the house? I mean, she, she's coming she over has to visit with Emma. House, yes. Yeah, I assume she's a neighbor girl. She's probably been over there, so uh, not a big deal there. So mm -hmm. um, you said they searched your room. Yes. Other than marijuana seeds and that sort of stuff. Did they? Did they find anything? Nope. Okay. Did they take anything? Um, they took my sheet and okay. a pillowcase. I okay. think. Did they take anything else? Um, I don't think so. I haven't really surveyed anything. Okay. Okay. I think they took clothes. Oh, they took a pair of clothes. Okay. And a diary. Okay. I mean, they gave us the list. I, it's not all coming to me what was on the list, but there's a long list. This moment is incredibly significant. Up until this point, Alyssa had no idea her diary was collected as evidence. I mean, they gave us the list. I can't, it's not all coming to me what was on the list, but there's a long list. Your diary. Okay. You ever gone through the diary? I've, I've looked at some of it, yes. Okay. Did you know that? No. Does it make you angry? No, no. Yeah. It's kind of your private, private personal thoughts, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Alyssa's bedroom was anything but ordinary of what you would expect for a 15-year-old girl. The room was messy, with clothes thrown on the floor, but it was the bizarre writings all over her walls that caught investigators' attention, and a drawn figure with slash marks to their head and arms, with the name Emma, Alyssa's younger sister, written next to it. Some of these writings, including dark poems, were written in pen and marker, but others looked like they'd been written in blood. Letters and cards were taped up onto the walls from her father, who was still in prison at the time, and on Alyssa's bed, hidden under a blanket, was her journal. She wrote down her thoughts and feelings like any normal teenage girl, but nothing could prepare the investigators for what else they would find inside. The journal was filled with disturbing thoughts, including Alyssa's desire to burn a house down with a family inside. She wrote another entry which stated, If I don't talk about it, I bottle it up and when I explode, someone is going to die. Her last entry, dated Wednesday, October 21st, was the same day Patty Olton reported Elizabeth's disappearance to the police. Alyssa had scribbled the words out in blue ink, thinking no one would ever figure out how to read them. Despite her efforts to cover up the entry, investigators were able to read the disturbing original writing. I just fucking killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my God, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now, LOL. This entire time, Detective Rice was well aware of the sickening confession Alyssa had written inside and was waiting up until this moment to confront her and take her completely off guard. From this point onward, there will be a massive shift in Alyssa's demeanor as she realizes the games are over. Do you think they went through your diary? If they collected it, then most likely. Okay. Do you think they took the diary? He remains silent for 13 seconds, and you can see how uncomfortable Alyssa becomes. He will continue to use long moments of silence to make Alyssa uncomfortable and eventually draw out a confession. The most important aspect of reading body language is analyzing clusters rather than individual indicators. In the following clip, you'll see a cluster of indicators that Alyssa exhibits, suggesting she is experiencing high levels of stress. So. She smacks her lips, so. swallows, flips her hair. She'll then exhibit what is known as the freeze response, which is a limbic system response to danger. She gets so still, she almost appears to be a statue. We talked a little bit earlier about technology. Mm -hmm. Even if you write something down, yeah, it doesn't matter. Let's say you write it down in pencil, and then you take a pen 
and try real hard to scratch it out, mm -hmm. that doesn't make it go away. Okay. It's still there. And forensically, and actually you don't even need a whole lot of forensics. If you hold it up to a light, you can see what was written. And then when that's processed forensically, every word, every stroke is still there. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. What we want to do is find out what happened to the little girl. Okay. Melissa's face, though a bit grainy in the footage, is almost frowning. She's struggling to keep it together, giving only short answers to Rice's questions. Then, Rice drops another bombshell. I need to know what the truth is. Okay. We have your diary. We've read your diary. Mm -hmm. Including the last entry. He goes silent for a full 70 seconds. Just over a minute, it may not seem like a very long time, but when you're in an interrogation and under pressure, this silence must have felt like the longest silence Alyssa ever endured. And you can see her face start to falter. Maybe her eyes are watering up, but it's hard to tell. Some argue that the first person who breaks silence in an interrogative setting loses the round. Alyssa indulges the silence, which might be more telling than if she objected to Rice's implication. Alyssa could be brainstorming. She could be terrified. It looks like there was a moment when Alyssa might break, but then she seems to reset her emotions and remain quiet, staring back at Sergeant Rice. We both know what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Where's she at? I don't know. What we deal with kids all the time. Mm -hmm. We deal with kids all the time. That's all I've done for 12 years is deal with kids. Mm -hmm. You're not going to say anything in this room that's going to catch us off guard. Okay? We need you to be honest. Just be honest. If you know something, then say it. Okay? Toby is making a serious error here by involving herself in the questioning. She is a juvenile officer, and in taking this role, she's supposed to be acting as Alyssa's advocate, not as an interrogator. She is limited to observing the interrogation and protecting Alyssa's rights. She is crossing the line here. And due to this mistake, the confession was later ruled inadmissible in court, citing deceptive tactics being used to draw a confession out of Alyssa. Please continue. Just say it if you know something. Okay. Go ahead. You need to tell us the truth. You need to tell us what happened. If this was an accident, that's fine, but we need the truth. With Rice saying it's fine if it, meaning the death of Elizabeth, was an accident, this is the minimization part of the read technique that's been used throughout this entire interrogation. Minimization is an interrogator's attempt to decrease a suspect's resistance to confessing by downplaying the seriousness of the crime. We can tell Alyssa is teetering on the precipice of confessing, toying with the idea, cornered by two questioners. She tightly compresses her lips as she builds the courage to confess. We have to know the truth. That's all I'm asking for, is whatever happened. I have to know the truth. This is not going to go away. All I'm asking for is the truth. I don't know what's in the diary. I don't know the truth. That's what I'm asking. Tell us what happened.
The lip pull is a micro-expression that signals intense displeasure, dislike, or disagreement. In sports, players will often exhibit the lip pull after a loss. They are resistantly admitting defeat. Alyssa exhibits the lip pull here. This may speak to Alyssa's mindset. Is this remorse or regret? Or is it defeat? The interrogator will now begin to reiterate the accident theory. And at this point, I think Alyssa's grandmother is losing her mind in a very quiet and composed way. If this, isn't, if this was an accident, that's fine. We can deal with that. But I have to know what happened. I have to know what the truth was. I have to know how this happened. And the most important thing is we have to know where she's at. We have to give this family some closure. Just like if this was your little sister, you would want closure. This family needs closure. Okay? Let's start at the beginning. Is this something that was planned out or was this just an accident? It was an accident. Okay. Interrogators often offer a chance for suspects to admit that the crime was an accident, even if all evidence suggests otherwise. This is a method for interrogators to get a foot in the door. The suspect admits to the crime, thinking they will be perceived as being less culpable, a form of minimization. It's telling that there was a pause between the words it and was. It was an accident. She's quickly thinking about her options and whether she can lie her way out of this situation. Well, that's this this is a starting point then. That's kind of what I thought. Why don't we start with why don't we start with what happened? Did you get home from school at 3.30? Yes, I did. You got home at 3.30? Mm-hmm. And then what happened from there? I went in the forest, like I said. Yes. Was she alone? Yeah. Okay. We decided to go hang out. Alyssa struggles to inhale. Her windpipe is constricting, which indicates the presence of severe stress. 
This biological marker of stress suggests Alyssa is legitimately affected. It could likewise be that Alyssa is effectively, intentionally, activating a stress response for the sake of believability. So, I burned her body. Alyssa goes from sobbing to attempting to pull herself together. She abruptly and flatly states the burnt Elizabeth's body. The time it took her to pull herself together is probably how long it took for her to come up with that lie. In reality, she didn't burn Elizabeth, as we'll soon find out what Alyssa actually did to her. Who helped you? Nobody. Rice asks another assumptive question. When interrogators assume answers, suspects with answers are more likely to share them. We're out in the forest. I still did it by the creek bed. By the creek bed? Yes. How did you burn her? Then just a bunch of wood. Started a fire. Burned her body. The only reason it seems she said she burned the body without knowing how difficult it is to actually burn a body is because burning would presumably get rid of evidence and the body of the missing girl everyone is looking for. Why did you dig that hole? Was that, did, was that for her? Well, when, I, when did you dig that hole? You dug it ahead of time, didn't you? I've done that whole on Wednesday. Before you played with her? Yes. First, she states she dug the hole the day of the murder to continue pushing the narrative that it was all just an accident. Then she slips up without even realizing it, stating the truth. The hole was dug on Friday, five days prior to the murder. At this point, Alyssa can't even follow her own story. Alyssa admitting to digging the hole before she and Elizabeth hung out establishes premeditation. It doesn't matter whether the body's burned or not. They'll go through and do an autopsy. Okay. And they will discover every injury on her body and the cause of death. And, and I understand you said she fell, and that's why she died. However, they will know from the autopsy if she was shot, if she was hit in the head, if her throat was cut. They will know all of that from the autopsy. So we need, we need to know the truth because at the end of the autopsy, they will know exactly how she died. So we need to know now the full truth, full disclosure right now. So it doesn't come out later that, well, it wasn't telling the full truth again. Then he calls her bluff. How did she kill her? I didn't. She died. How did she die? Nine-year-old girls don't just die. We were messing her out. But she fell back and hit her head. Was her throat cut? Alyssa sharply exhales as she responds. Yeah. Oh. We see Alyssa's emotional appeal to her grandmother. Her emotional stuntedness appears to have limits. Individuals with psychopathic and sociopathic personality traits or tendencies, while removed from feeling in a multitude of ways, may experience normal feelings of love for family and others closest to them. Grandma. Oh my God. I'm not going to ask any questions right now until we get... Oh, that's not
Alyssa finally admits to cutting Elizabeth Olden's throat. Alyssa's grandmother cries out in utter anguish and disbelief. Her entire world was just destroyed. Her granddaughter, the one she rescued from a horrible living situation, just admitted to killing a nine-year-old girl. But why did Alyssa kill her? I think, I think you got the whole ahead of time. Because you knew you were going to kill I think you tried to dig the hole, like I said, and realized it was too hard to dig down that far. And I think you got out there. They knew you were going to kill her. And then you cut her throat. Is that what happened? Yes. We hear Alyssa exhale heavily, possibly a sign of relief, as she runs through her actions. She does this multiple times. What did you use to cut her throat with? A pocket knife, a kitchen knife, kitchen knife. Okay. Where is that kitchen knife now? The sink. The sink of your house. I believe so. Okay. Did you stab her? Afterwards. Stab her body or where? Yes. Okay. How many times did you stab her? Two. Two. I think. Alyssa leans on words such as I believe and I think. These phrases often function as hedges. In some instances, hedges serve to soften statements or make them seem more cautious. Imagine how Alyssa would sound when responding to questions without these hedge phrases. Her response may seem overly cold and blunt, suggesting emotional detachment and even premeditation. Given Alyssa has displayed socio and or psychopathic tendencies thus far, it would be reasonable to conclude that she is consciously employing a social adaptive mechanism or a learned regularity in human social behavior to mimic the normal flow of human conversation. Did you hit her with anything first? No. Or did you just cut her neck? Or what, you tell me what happened. Premeditation has been established because she dug a grave prior to Elizabeth's murder, and Alyssa finally tells Rice what the murder weapon was, a black-handled kitchen knife that she took from her house and hid on her person. It's confirmed that Alyssa slit Elizabeth's throat and then stabbed her. Alyssa only recalls stabbing her twice, but the autopsy later revealed that Elizabeth was stabbed eight times. When she was finished, she just put the knife in the sink and washed it as if nothing had happened. When you got home from school, about 3.30, mm -hmm. what happened from then? Walk me through step by step. Uh, I got home. I went in my room. I still went out for four hours. Five, three-ish. Then I walked over and was outside. Did you, when did you dig the hole? Um, I dug that when I was trying to find a place to hide her body. So did you dig that after you killed her? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. So at about 5.30, you went out. Did you go to her house to get her? 
Mm-hmm. I went over there and she was outside, so that's like, yeah. You were going to do it then. Okay, so you went over there about 5.30 and got her. Uh, was she with you? She was part of the way. Like did, I said, I ditched her. You ditched her? Yeah. Did she have the knife hidden on you? Or where was it at? Yeah, it was, I had it. In your hand? No. Okay. So you went, did you walk all the way over to her house? Yeah. Okay. Show me what route you went. I went back through here. Went and got her. What did you tell her you were going to do? We were just hanging out at first. I, I don't know. I didn't. Did you, had you made up your decision you were going to kill her then? No. At what point did you make the decision that you were going to kill her? When we had been at the creek. Okay. Why? Serial killers murder victims who are readily available, easily accessible, vulnerable, isolated or weak, and desirable, uniquely appealing. Elizabeth was a neighbor, easily accessible. She was a nine-year-old girl, vulnerable. One can only speculate how Elizabeth might have uniquely appealed to Alyssa. Either way, Alyssa cannot identify why she did what she did, just as she seems to struggle to identify her emotions. Was 15-year-old Alyssa a premature, fledgling serial killer? You just decided. Okay. Was she facing you? Was she turned around? What, what happened? She was turned around. You just came up behind her and cut her throat. And then stabbed her twice. And is it true you said then you burn her body? Okay, is that part true? Mm -hmm. So is her body should still be there? I burned it and then I like scattered it in the the creek. Into the creek? Yes. Is the creek full of water? Yes. Okay. Because generally it's pretty hard to burn a body all the way. So it wasn't burned up all the way, was it? No. No, because it's hard to burn a body. Right. So you kind of pushed what was left of the body into the water. Mm -hmm. Was the water moving pretty fast? Kind of. Okay. Clothes still? You can still see her clothes? Were they burned off of her body? Okay. And you took the knife back home? Mm Mm-hmm. And then what did you do from there? You had the knife, and then show me what happened from there. I just walked back and came inside. Did you walk back this path that you showed me? Uh, Yes. The conversation turns back to the hole. What about the hole, though? Um, It was just there. Okay. No, it wasn't just there. I dug it. When when, when did you dig it? Oh, after I... I was looking for something to do with your body, so I dug it. When? It was before I came home. Before you came home from where? From the forest. Who helped you? No. Grandpa helped you, didn't he? No. Rice asks her if her grandfather helped her since he was home at the time the murder took place. You didn't have a shovel with you. I had a knife. You couldn't, you didn't dig that hole with a knife. You did not dig, I was out there for five hours. You didn't dig that hole with a knife. 
Your grandpa loves you very much, doesn't he? Your grandpa would do anything for you. I know you don't want to tell me. I know you want to protect him. But we have got to get to the truth in this. You came back. You told him what had happened. And he wanted to help you. He wanted to try to make this right. So it sounds like I thought anything. Who helped you? No one. We're going to put them all on a polygraph. Okay. Who helped you? Someone. When did you dig the hole? The Wednesday. When? After I killed her. When and after you killed her. This is a very common tactic in interrogations. Once the suspect is open about events, they'll try to get more and more information out of them. The investigators will treat this crime as if it involves accomplices until other parties can be eliminated. The hole becomes the topic of discussion yet again. You've got to tell the truth. You're not telling the truth on this part. Why does it even matter now? It does matter. Because we have got to find out the truth. Well, you already know it. We have got to know the full truth. Tell us the truth. I don't want to wait back. No, you didn't. You didn't have a show. It was the Friday one. <coughs> Tell them the truth about how you killed her. I believe that because that matches your diary. You've done the hard part. Yeah. Just, just tell the truth. The reality is, we can deal with the truth. We can deal with the truth. <laughs> Toby assumes a critical role in facilitating Alyssa's confession. <laughs> I don't get Friday. Was it David? Was it? No one helped me. Was it, was it your grandpa? No one helped me. I did it by myself. It's interesting to see how Alyssa goes from trying to lie and pretend she had nothing to do with the missing little girl to finally admitting she dug a grave and killed her. But Sergeant Rice and Toby can't believe that she committed the crime herself or dug the hole. They think her grandfather had something to do with it too. They are almost giving Alyssa away to continue her lie, but she's probably the most truthful when they try to implicate her grandfather. Probably out of love for him, because if there were ill feelings between them, there's no doubt she would attempt to throw him under the bus. Did you do anything else to her body? No. Did anyone help you? No. Who have you told about this? No one. No one. So no. Tell no. Did you tell your grandpa? No. Did you tell your friend? No. Did you tell anyone? No. There's a good reason that the investigators think Alyssa didn't act alone. Even her boyfriend said that he doesn't think she could have carried out the crime by herself. Quite literally. I don't think she did this alone. She couldn't have. I don't think she did either. I don't think she could barely, barely with me. I know. Who would be the person that would help her? The only good friend that I know of that she always came out with in the back was a girl named uh, That's about it. She's right. Toby's right. You've done the hard part hard on this. One thing I can assure you, Alyssa, I can assure you from working in a lot of homicides for the last 13 years, I do the, I've got a crummy job. I, the truth is going to come out. Every one of these that I work, where, where you're sitting here right now, going through the agonizing part of not wanting to come this last portion and tell on someone else. 
Well, the truth, the truth, there. the truth is going to, the full truth on whatever happened here is going to come out. Okay, they didn't do it. Then tell me the full truth of all this. Why aren't you, why aren't you telling everything? I did. I switched up the whole thing. Because I don't want to make it good. <laughs> accident. But then I was up, it really was on Friday that I did the whole. I know it wasn't an accident. I've already talked with you. I know you planned this. I know you. I know you had this in your mind. I, I know you thought about this, and I know you intended on, on doing this. I. I know that. Okay. This. I know this wasn't an accident. Did it just spur the moment? I know that from the whole. Mm -hmm. I know you intended on killing her. Brought her out there for that purpose. But the problem is your deception is causing us other issues here. Okay, so I'm, I'm past the point of thinking, is this an accident? Did, did she hit her head? Did, did you just change your mind at the last second and for some reason decide to kill her? I know you brought her out there to kill her. Okay, why? It's, what's, well, that's not the issue, but I know that happened. But we're still having a problem here with this whole and the rest of it because you've been lying to us on that. You see, I mean, none of your times make any sense on you didn't dig it with a knife. We know that didn't happen. It was Friday with the shovel. When on Friday? I'm not sure exactly. This is where we see the shift from the lesser charge of involuntary manslaughter, a crime of passion, to that of a premeditated murder. It's clear Alyssa planned her crime from beginning to end. She planned to lure Elizabeth into the woods to play and to dig a grave a few days before she killed her. There were signs leading up to the murder that either people didn't pay attention to, wrote off as someone just seeking attention, or it was entirely possible that they didn't think anything was wrong. Alyssa seemed to live a double life. At school, she had friends and pulled good grades, never letting them fall below a B average. Her teacher said she was a smart kid and never had any behavioral issues in school. Her social media presence showed an entirely different Alyssa. Her YouTube bio listed her hobbies as cutting and killing people. Her Twitter page gave an insight into some of Alyssa's more concerning thoughts, as she often wrote about depression, addiction, and terror. In particular, one tweet read, All I want in life is a reason for all this pain. These types of comments weren't at all unusual for Alyssa. Case documents show that one of Alyssa's friends was interviewed by police. They said that over the last couple of years, Alyssa had said to them, I wonder what it would feel like to kill someone. According to her friend, Alyssa would even talk about what would happen if she did kill someone, speculating about whether or not she would get caught and how exactly she would kill someone. The friend thought she was joking. She'd even said something similar to her boyfriend. She asked me that? Yeah. Okay. Think about when somebody asks you, do you know what it feels like to kill somebody? You don't think it's odd. No. That's just something you have normal conversation with somebody about. I think it's brought up in this normal conversation. That's happened to you a lot. She, she's emo and emos think about that kind of she's stuff. She's what? She's emo, so emos think about that kind of stuff. What's so emo? People who like to cut themselves and stuff like that. So and think dark things. Okay. But I didn't know that she was actually capable of doing But then on either Wednesday, October 21st, or Thursday, October 22nd, Alyssa called her friend. Depending on which day it actually was, 
It was either the day she killed Elizabeth or the following day. Alyssa told the friend that she had done something really bad. The friend asked her if she knew about the little girl that was missing, and Alyssa told her yes, but asked why she was asking. Alyssa repeated over and over to the friend that it was all supposed to be a game. There were videos on her YouTube channel that involved doing dangerous things like touching a live electric fence around her grandparents' horse paddock. She forced her twin brothers to touch it and edited the video to say right before the boys touched the fence, this is where it gets good, where my brothers get hurt. Experts say that all of this, along with her other behaviors, indicate that Alyssa had a sadistic need to hurt others and got a lot of pleasure from it even experiencing a release of all the painful emotions she held deep inside her. Alyssa didn't just try to hurt others, as she often directed the need to inflict pain on herself. At a young age, Alyssa had started hurting herself. All of this came to a head when at 13, she attempted to take her own life. She fully recovered and spent time in a mental health facility where she was prescribed the antidepressant Prozac. She began to see several counselors during her time at the facility, and once she was released, she underwent intensive outpatient treatment. So, while she ended up getting help, it didn't really help her. Back in the interrogation room, Sergeant Rice is trying to get Alyssa to empathize, or at the very least sympathize with the Olden family about how they need help recovering Elizabeth's body so they can have closure. While that may be the first priority for the victim's family, it's law enforcement's priority to recover the body so a forensic autopsy can be performed to corroborate the suspect's statements and generate additional evidence for the prosecution. Toby begins to explain to Alyssa that the judicial system treats people who tell the truth differently than those that lie. This is when Alyssa finally drops the story about burning the body and tells them what she really did to Elizabeth Olton. We're going to have to talk some more about this, obviously. But for right now, I need to get a larger map. Unconscious, dead, and then you slit her throat. Mm -hmm. And did you actually did you stab her then? Mm -hmm. Did you do anything else to her? Right. Okay. And then what happened after that? I went up. Buried your body. It's unclear why Alyssa seems so unsure that Elizabeth's body will be in the same location. The implication by Detective Rice is that Alyssa may have had help, and it's interesting to note how uncertain she is that Elizabeth will still be there. You didn't bother, did you? No. Yeah, I knew you did. Still out there in the same spot? I believe so. Okay. Finally, the truth. She strangled her, stabbed her, slit her throat, and then buried the body in the hole she dug on Friday. Interestingly, the specific hole that has been in question the entire interrogation was never used as the gravesite of Elizabeth Olton. Did the hole that I saw that you pointed out, what was that about? That was, I don't know, the 
Okay. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Why? What was? Okay. How deep did you dig the grave that she's in? It's not that deep. Okay. Will you be able to point out on a map and take us to where she's at? Mm-hmm. Okay. You didn't burn her, did you? No. You bring a shovel with you? No. How did you dig the hole? That was if I had already dug it. Okay. When did you dig that hole? That one was also on Friday. Okay, so you dug the hole on Friday mm-hmm. and had it all ready. Did you leave the shovel out there? No. Okay. So the hole was already dug on Friday, mm-hmm. and then you brought her out there Wednesday. Killed her there on Wednesday, strangled her, then cut her throat, stabbed her twice, put her in the hole, and then how'd you fill the dirt in? With my hands. With your hands. There's still something. There's still something. Toby takes this opportunity to push for any last pieces of information that Alyssa could be concealing. There's still something you're not telling. I can tell. Well, I'm saying it. Sure. Yes. Yes. Alyssa had dug two holes that Friday. The first hole that had been discussed at length in the interrogation ended up being the one law enforcement found early on. But Alyssa says that she couldn't dig too deep in that area. So she moved to another area where she could, and that's where they would find nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton's body. As the interviewer has noted, the two holes are interesting, but not everyone buys Alyssa's explanation. There is a theory that Alyssa may have dug two holes, because she had originally planned to kill her two younger brothers. However, this theory hasn't been corroborated, and so we may never know exactly why Alyssa chose to dig two holes. Now that the story is clearly laid out, they've established how the murder was done and where the body is. Sergeant Rice moves on to the motive, the reason Alyssa did it. Why did you pick her? I don't know. Just Was there something about her? Did you just want to? Did you just want to know what it was like to kill someone? Yeah, I just wanted to know. Alyssa appears to cry, but her response carries a tone of indifference. Thrill killing. It is the act of killing someone for sheer excitement. Alyssa killed Elizabeth because she wanted to know what it would feel like to kill someone. Thrill killing stems from a place of powerlessness. These killers are empowered by their murders. Was she just someone nearby? Or was it? Yeah. <laughs> She straddles the fence between emotional upset and removedness. She lowers her head, holding her face in her hands. Psychopaths and sociopaths are not incapable of experiencing guilt and remorse, particularly if they have comorbid conditions like borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder. She could regret killing Elizabeth out of remorse, but she could also regret killing her for a more selfish reason. She knows the repercussions. She breaks down once Rice leaves to retrieve a larger map. Toby attempts to reassure Alyssa. Again, we see her emotional instability. She struggles to self-regulate. Okay. 
Prozac. <laughs> Prozac is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, an antidepressant medication primarily used to treat major depressive disorder. If Alyssa has an underlying mood disorder, like bipolar disorder, she might experience increased psychotic symptoms, as disorders like these are sensitive to imbalanced levels of serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that plays a role in modulating mood, sleep, and cognition. Specifically, antidepressants prevent the breakdown of serotonin, which may lead to an overabundance in individual systems. Psychosis looks different from individual to individual, but it can involve increased aggression, hallucinations, delusions, mania, and other psychotic symptoms. Psychosis characterized by paranoid hallucinations, delusions, and aggression may lead to violent behavior. Childhood maltreatment and or neglect is a strong predictor of suicidal ideation, pathological aggression, and criminality, all of which are present in Alyssa. She let me Dissociation is the separation of oneself from one's identity, memories, thoughts, and or feelings. It's associated with childhood trauma, particularly that of an emotionally abusive or neglectful nature. Dissociation is linked to post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative disorder, mood disorders, borderline personality disorder, and more. How Toby is walking Alyssa through the process of grounding. Grounding is a technique, often used in therapy in crisis situations, that pulls individuals away from flashbacks or disturbing emotions into the present. She encourages Alyssa to use her breath as an anchor, a sensory tool to call attention to physical rather than emotional sensations. Killing yourself right now. Don't have any sharp objects in your shoes or anything like that. Okay. What we're going to do right now is just kind of get some things lined up to, um, to go out there and have you point out uh, that side where she's at. Okay. Will you be able to do that? Once alone, Alyssa almost immediately regulates her breathing. Her head hangs low. The reality is that your grandmother loved you and love doesn't stop. Okay? I don't want you to think nobody nobody loves you. Your grandparents love you. Love is unconditional. Absolutely. She loves you unconditionally. She's not going to understand why this happened. And you know, there are going to be some, you guys have, uh, you know, I have a sugar coat this year. You guys have some rough times to hang with you. Uh, but she's not going to stop loving you. 
And when you came back home, what did you do with that gun? Put it in the sink. Did you clean it? Yeah. Describe the knife to me. It's kitchen knife. Like black handle. Black handle. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does it have, is it just straight edge? Does it have those serrations in it? Do you know it's what I'm a, talking it's a straight about? Edge. Straight edge. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get in trouble though. Yeah. Okay. Because Alyssa's a juvenile, Sergeant Rice explains what's going to happen next in the investigation. How they must speak to everyone that could be involved to get to the truth especially since Alyssa lied at the beginning of the interrogation. Alyssa is then prepped to go out with Sergeant Rice. They're going back to the woods so that she can recount the crime and show them where she buried Elizabeth. Here's the audio from that excursion. It is uh, day October 23rd, 2009, 2 o'clock. Sergeant David Rice from Missouri State Highway Patrol. And it is Michael Couty with a uh, Cole County Juvenile Juvenile Office. And uh, we're here um, in Cole County uh, at the site where you say uh, this occurred, where you've been. Um, mm-hmm. Can you walk me through? I want you to walk me through step by step um, when you got up here, what actually occurred. Um, before everything just happened. I'm gonna drag her into the hole. There you go. Okay. What happened here? I strangled her. Okay. And then cut her throat and stabbed her. Okay. When you strangled her, was she was she facing you? Yeah. Okay. So she was facing you, looking towards you? Mm-hmm. You strangled her one hand? Two. Two hands. Okay. And what happened? Did she stand up, fall to the ground? What happened? She had fallen to the ground. Okay. Was she moving at that point? No. Okay. Um, so she was lying on the ground. Mm-hmm. Was she face down on her no. back? She was on her back. Okay. And where was, you said you earlier you had a knife. Where was your knife at that point? Um, I put it back in my pocket. Well, like, not pocket, but like, I held it. Here, Alyssa doesn't even remember where she placed her knife during the attack. It's unclear if she's even telling the truth still at this point, since every detail seems so muddled. Which, which pocket was it in? Front, It was like back. in my waist. Always your waist. Yeah. Like, okay. Right okay. And that was the knife that you told me about mm-hmm. with the black handle that yep. you told me earlier. Okay. And what did you do with the knife? I put it in the sink. No, no. When you were here, once you said she was on the ground not moving, you said, well, after that point, what did you do? I um, cut her throat and then stabbed her. You cut her throat and stabbed her. Where did you stab her? In her chest area. In her chest area? Yeah. In the front or in the back? Front. In the front. Okay. How many times? Twice, I believe. Alyssa's story still doesn't add up. Although continually claiming she stabbed Elizabeth twice, the autopsy report revealed she was stabbed a total of eight times in the chest. Twice. Okay. And then... What happened after that? Mm, dragged her into the hole. Dragged her into this hole over here? Okay. And when did you dig that hole? Friday. Okay. How did you cover her up? Did you have a shovel or no, something here? I just used my hands. Used your hands? Okay. And this is the hole over here? She's in her. How deep is that hole? It's not very deep. Okay. All right. Okay, and I think we've talked about everything else back at the office. I just wanted to go over. Is there anything else? This all happened right about here. Mm-hmm. Are you pretty sure of that? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you leave anything out here that you can think of? Um, I think you dropped a piece of gum somewhere. 
You did? She did. She dropped a piece of gum. Where do you think that was at? Um, I'm not sure. It's probably under some leaves now. But... What happened to her phone? <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it was in her pocket the entire time. In her pocket? Yes. So do you think her phone is in her pocket in that hole? Yes. Okay. Did you ever hear it go off? No. Alyssa claimed she never heard Elizabeth's phone ring, contradicting Elizabeth's mother, who claimed she called her phone over and over again. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and shut the tape off then. She used her hands to cover Elizabeth's body with leaves, dirt, and twigs. Once the body was recovered and autopsied, Elizabeth Holton was laid to rest on Wednesday, October 28, 2009. She was buried in a pink coffin and carried to the cemetery by a horse-drawn carriage. Mourners wore pink and released balloons. Elizabeth's aunt described her as the morning sun that pops out over the mountain. She was sunshine, and you couldn't help but love her. In the end, it seems some details just don't add up, and it's clear that investigators believed Alyssa had some sort of help. And along with all the inconsistencies, Dustin's explanation behind how he discovered Alyssa killed Elizabeth was strange, to say the least. On Thursday, October 22nd, the day after Elizabeth's murder, Dustin stayed home sick and claimed Alyssa skipped school to spend the day with him at his residence. His mother unexpectedly arrived home at approximately 12.30 or 1 p.m. He ushered Alyssa into a closet to hide, giving her clothes to change into for unknown reasons and continued to check on her repeatedly while she was hiding. While Dustin's mother was getting into the shower, he claimed Alyssa suddenly confessed that she strangled, cut, and killed the girl. He then claimed he told her she had to leave, guiding her to go out the front door while his mother was in the shower. This was his last alleged communication with Alyssa. And the day after this happened, you skipped school and you're smoking pot with... Mm -hmm. Right? you tell him about this? No. Why not? You guys are that you're close. Didn't you feel like you needed to tell somebody? No, that's not really the kind of thing that you tell people. Investigators also picked up on what they believed was a slip-up at the beginning of his interrogation. All that I know is what the FBI told me. What did they tell you? They told me that she buried him and then slit her throat and stabbed her. She already had a, a thumb hook dug hole. And they buried her. She wasn't big enough, so then they buried her again. They buried her again? I mean, yeah. Who's they? I mean, Who's they? I didn't mean you're, you're, you're not in trouble here, okay? You're not in a lot of trouble here. I didn't mean they. You're not in a lot of trouble here, bud. It's just what I've been saying for the past couple of days. Because I just couldn't see the doing that by yourself. But obviously, you just told me that there was another person involved that I can believe. No, you told me that. Alyssa was charged with first-degree murder. Yet even though she had confessed and even led law enforcement to the very site where she killed and buried Elizabeth, she entered a not guilty plea. She was certified as an adult on November 18, 2009 due to the adult nature of her crime. The Cole County Circuit Judge assigned to the trial ruled that her crime was vicious and that the Missouri State Juvenile Facilities were unequipped to deal with someone who could commit such a crime. For over a year, Alyssa stuck to her plea of not guilty. The day before her trial, January 9, 2012, she withdrew her not guilty plea and agreed to plead guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder. Since she took the plea deal that had been presented to her, she waived her right to a jury trial, but as a condition of the deal, she needed to get up in front of the courtroom and tell the events of that fateful day. The courtroom was filled with both her family and Elizabeth's family, along with most of the St. Martin's community. Alyssa told the court what she'd done, speaking in a clear, emotionless voice. 
she'd strangled Elizabeth with her hands and used the kitchen knife for the rest of the attack. Nearly everyone in the courtroom already knew the details of the murder since it was well publicized in the media. However, this was the first time hearing it straight from the murderer herself. Elizabeth's mother, Patty, sobbed while Alyssa retold her daughter's murder. There were several reasons that the courts probably reduced the charges. At the time, it was a gray area whether it was legal to sentence a teenager to life without parole. The United States Supreme Court was getting ready to hear another case about two teenage murderers, and they needed to decide if life without parole was cruel and unusual punishment for people so young. The defense said that Alyssa was diagnosed with major depression, anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder from her difficult upbringing, borderline personality disorder, and showed early signs of bipolar disorder, and more importantly, that all of these diagnoses were the reasons behind her killing of Elizabeth Olton. Case documents reveal a police interview with a mental health professional who had worked with Alyssa for two years. They shared that during an annual assessment of Alyssa, only one month before the interview and Elizabeth's disappearance, the mental health professional had become concerned that her depression was spiraling and her delinquent behavior was increasing. Alyssa had actually called this mental health professional soon after Elizabeth went missing. During the call, Alyssa said she was distressed about the police being in her house and searching for clues about what happened to Elizabeth. One of the most interesting pieces from the case document is that the mental health professional initially said they had no concern about Alyssa being involved in the little girl's disappearance. Because in their experience, Alyssa never expressed a desire to harm anyone else but herself. Another doctor even agreed with this same belief. However, they also conceded that they could be wrong. This interview took place two days after Alyssa killed Elizabeth. Alyssa's defense tried to prove she didn't know that murdering someone was wrong. In contrast to this, the mental health professional was asked during the police interview about whether or not Alyssa understood the difference between right and wrong, to which they replied, absolutely. Her defense also pointed out that Alyssa's dose of Prozac was increased only a short time before she killed Elizabeth. They claim that this increase may have played a role in making her behavior unpredictable and even could have made her more prone to violence. One question that everyone comes back to is why Alyssa had done it. Her grandfather said that the night Alyssa killed Elizabeth, she seemed to be in an unusually good mood. Her mood, along with her journal entry, show that Alyssa was likely a thrill killer. Thrill killers receive a rush of euphoric adrenaline from the act of killing their victims, which would explain why Alyssa was so happy after the gruesome murder. On February 8, 2012, Alyssa addressed the court and apologized, saying, I really am extremely sorry for everything. I know words can never be enough to describe how horribly I feel for all of this. If I could give my life to get her back, I would. I'm sorry. Alyssa was sentenced to life in prison, but this story doesn't end there. Due to the publicized nature of the crime and the lead up to the trial, Alyssa became something of an underground celebrity. There's an online fan club and Facebook groups in support of Alyssa, some displaying artwork of her and even profiles using her picture, pretending to be her. Alyssa would have been eligible for parole for the first time in 2044, but since the Senate Bill 26 passed, someone convicted as a minor can ask for parole after 15 years. This means there is a chance Alyssa could be up for parole as early as 2027.